again and uh, we are continuing to talk about pressure points and this morning we're going to talk about a muscle in your body. It's a muscle in your body that has tremendous power. In fact, it is the most powerful and influential muscle that you have. And we're going to look at what God has to say about this muscle. It only weighs a couple of ounces and yet it has the power to generate incredible influence. It can be used for great good or it can be used for great evil. This muscle is something that you use every day of your life and it's a pressure point for our life. Of course, you can probably guess what the muscle is. Anybody got a guess? Isaiah. Your tongue. It looks something like this. Ugh. All right. Now, I can assure you this is not any of your tongues, all right? Nor is it mine. It's a random tongue from the internet. I figured it would be less embarrassing that way. It's actually not a, well, as far as tongues go, it could be worse. I, when I googled tongue pictures, there were some much uglier ones that showed up. But I spared you because I love you. But our tongues form words. Our tongues form words. And of course, that's what we're looking at this morning. I appreciate the testimony last night and how we talked a little bit about our words last night. And this morning we're talking about the pressure that words place on our life. And think about how powerful words are. Words can comfort and soothe. As a dad, I've gotten to listen to my wife soothe and comfort our children with her words, with a song, with quiet words. And it's amazing to see the power that words can have to comfort and to soothe. Words can challenge and inspire us. Words can bring life. As you share the gospel with someone, your words have the power to point them towards life. Our words are powerful. We can encourage people with our words. But we can also wound people with our words. How many of you have ever been wounded by a word? Alright. That whole sticks and stones may break my bones but words can never hurt me thing. Big lie. Alright. One of the biggest lies that we've ever promoted. And we say that because we're trying to cover up the hurt that the words have caused us. Words can wound and hurt. Words can kill. They can kill hope. They can kill desire, they can kill motivation, and they can even lead someone to despair to the point of taking their own life. Words have tremendous power. In fact, Solomon put it like this. He says, the tongue has the power of life and death. The tongue has the power of life and and death. That's pretty serious, isn't it? It really doesn't get any bigger than that. He says the tongue has the power of life and the power of death and this little two ounce muscle that lives inside of your mouth contains this incredible power, the power of life and death and we all know how hard it is to control our tongue, isn't it? How many of you have ever had a moment where you had trouble controlling your mouth? All right. How many of you ever had your mom or dad or somebody to say to you, watch your mouth? How many of you did that? Now, follow-up question. How many of you sort of came back with a sarcastic, well, I can't see my mouth, so I can't watch it? All right. That shows us just how hard it is to control this because we know we're about to get in trouble and we're already being reprimanded for our words and then we say something, we just, we just can't, it just comes out. Our words have tremendous power and within that power there's power to do good but there's also power to do evil and so this morning we're going to look at what James has to say about this pressure point in our life because it's so important because words have the power of life and death. You have the power of life and death within your mouth and that's a serious thing and it's a serious pressure. So let's look together. James chapter 3, you have your Bible. We're going to work through what James has to say about our mouths. Verse 2 is where we're going to start. James chapter 3, beginning in verse 2, he says, For we all stumble in many ways. So he just lets us know, hey, none of us are perfect. We all have areas of life that God's still at work in. We all have areas that, that God is still refining and sanctifying in our life. He says, we all stumble in many ways, but if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. So James is saying, we stumble, we all have areas that we struggle with, but he says, if you can control your mouth, then you can control every part of your life because the mouth, the tongue, is the hardest part of life to control. It's an incredible pressure that all of us have to learn how to manage. Because within the tongue is what? The power of life and death. Your words have the power to exert control over your life. They have the power to 
influence so much of what happens. And so James goes on and he talks about how hard it is to control our mouth. Look at verses 3 and 4. He says, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. And so James uses these illustrations for us. He says, just as you can control a horse, a powerful animal, by putting a bit in its mouth, and just as a ship, although it's massive and mighty, wherever that rudder is turned, that's the direction the ship is going to take. And he says, just as a mighty ship is controlled by a relatively small rudder, and just as a powerful horse can be controlled by a bit in its mouth, so your life is controlled by your words and your mouth. Our lives are controlled by what we say and it affects other people's lives. Our tongues are powerful. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. So this is a huge pressure point. All of us within our mouth have this incredible power and how we manage it and how we use it has an incredible influence not only on our own life but on the people that we speak to and the people that we interact with. You have life and death in the power of your tongue. And look at what James has to say about this power. He says, basically, if the tongue were a person, it would brag about its power. Look at verse 5. He says, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. So think about that. He says, if, the tongue, if we personified the tongue, if we made the tongue into its own little person, can you just sort of imagine your tongue as a person? Are you, are you awake enough to do that? All right. God gave us an imagination. We should use it, right? So imagine your tongue as a person. If your tongue was a person, it would brag about how powerful it was. He says, the tongue is a small member, and yet it boasts of great things. For how great a forest is set ablaze, by such a small fire. And if the tongue is a fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life. And it is set on fire by hell. Wow. So if the tongue was a, a, a person, it would brag about its power. And then he goes on and he talks about our tongue and he says, it's like a, a fire. And he says, you only need a little tiny fire to set a whole forest ablaze. So our tongue is powerful. It has the ability. And then he says, it's not only a fire, it is a world of unrighteousness. It stains the whole body. It sets on fire the entire course of life. You know, fire is powerful. And, and fire is a great illustration because fire can be powerfully good or powerfully bad, right? Fire has the power to protect life. Fire has the power to preserve life. How many of you watch survival shows? Anyone watch survival shows? All right, four of you. That's great. Well, if you watch survival shows, one of the things you quickly realize is that if you're out trying to survive in the wilderness, one of the things you want to do is have a fire. It can protect you. It can keep you from hypothermia. You can boil water. There's lots of great good that fire can do. But when fire escapes its place and its boundaries, it has the power to destroy. And James uses this illustration for our words, and he says, your words are like a flame. They're like a fire. And they have incredible power to both do good, but also to destroy. And here's something about fire. What is destroyed by fire can be replaced, but not recovered. You see, if, if you have possessions or belongings and a fire burns them up, you'll never, ever, ever have them back again. You can replace them. If a fire burns up your couch, you can buy a new couch. You can replace it. But you'll never have the one that was burned back again. What's destroyed by fire may be replaced, but never recovered. And so it is with our words. The words that come out of your mouth, the words that go forth when you hit send, right? They never, ever, ever come back. You, you can't, how many of you ever said something you said, I take that back, right? Or you thought, I wish I could, I wish I could just grab that and take it back, but you can't take it back, can you? Once your words leave your mouth, they are irrecoverable and you can't 
take them back. And James says, they stain our lives. The, in fact, he says the entire course of life. And literally there, in the original language, it's the idea of a circle of physical events. A pattern that's repeated. And James says this pattern, our habits with our words, are set on fire by hell. Now certainly, this refers to the fact that, that there's evil and Satan's influence over the evil things that we say. But it was also a really graphic and visual picture for the original audience. As, as James's original readers would have read this letter, they would have got this graphic picture because the word he uses for hell was the word Gehenna. And this was an actual real place. It was a valley outside of Jerusalem. And it was where they took the trash and the refuge, refuse and, and dung and they would take dead animals and bodies there and they would dump them in this valley and they burned the trash and the bodies there. And this place smoldered continuously. And if you just again use your imagination you can kind of imagine how that smelled, can't you? And burning and so as James's readers are, are hearing these words and they're looking at these words they get this really graphic visual about their words. He says that is what our words are like. It's a graphic picture of what can come out of our mouth. You know, all kinds of destruction can come out of your mouth, can it? We can use profane words. We can use hateful words, angry words, thoughtless words, mean words, selfish words, critical words, sarcastic words, dishonest words. You know, sometimes we deliver them by yelling. Sometimes we deliver them quietly and purposefully. Sometimes we deliver them on Facebook. Sometimes we deliver them in a text. It really doesn't matter how you choose to deliver them. Whatever the method of delivery, our words have incredible power to inflict damage. And this is a pressure point that we have to manage. Look at what James says in verse 7. He says, For every kind of beast and bird, and reptile, and sea creature, can be tamed, and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue, for it is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So he says, our words are not only like a fire that can destroy, but he says they're like a poison that wound, and injure, and kill. And he says, no one can tame the tongue. No one can tame the tongue. That's why the whole watch your mouth, watch what you say. If you ever notice how hard it is to do that and how easily things come out of our mouth that we wish we didn't say, it's because you in and of yourself do not have the power to tame your tongue. You can put a filter on your mouth, right? You, you've learned not to say certain things around certain people because you may get in trouble or be looked down on. But ultimately, the words are still there. Because no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil. And it's full of deadly poison. And James says we lack the ability to control it. That ought to get your attention. It's sort of like we should all have a t-shirt. Maybe we could get these t-shirts made. That says warning. Right? Big letters right across the front of your shirt. It says warning. Restless evil within. <laughs> contains poison. Known to throw flames. All right, and that way everyone would know, whoa, got to be careful. Because that's exactly it. That's exactly what James says. He says there's this restless evil within us. It's full of deadly poison. It's known to throw flames. He goes on in verse 9 and he says, With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people made in the likeness of God. He says, I've noticed something really amazing about our mouth. We can come into chapel and we can go to sing time and we can sing amazing and beautiful praises to God. And then we can go out from this place and we cut people down with our words and we pick on them and we make fun of them. We go out and we say things that are ugly and harsh and cruel. And James says it ought not to be like that. Verse 10, he says, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, he says, these things ought not to be so. He says, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Our mouths are inconsistent, and it isn't right, and it doesn't honor God, and we don't have the ability within ourselves to control it. So what 
is the solution? What is the answer to this problem that we all have to deal with? Well, the answer is this. What we can't control, God can transform. That's the amazing news because the gospel, the same gospel, the good news that tells us that we are sinners separated from God, but that Jesus came in his love for you and his love for me. He came to this world. He lived a life that you could never live. He lived a sinless life, a perfect life. Jesus always used his words perfectly. And that same Jesus died on a cross for you. He was buried and he rose from the dead. And he not only has the power to forgive you and to save you, to make you his child, but he has the power to transform your life, including your mouth. What we can't control, God can transform. And he transforms our mouth by dealing with our mouth's accomplice. You see, the tongue brags about its power, but the tongue is powerless by itself. Because the tongue is ultimately controlled by the heart. Have you ever said something and thought or said, where did that come from? Or you said, I'm sorry, I just, I don't know where that came from. How many of you have ever either said that or heard that said? All right, all of us. We've either said it or we've heard it. But here's the thing, I can tell you where it came from. It came from your heart. So the next time you feel that way, you just say, I'm sorry, that came from my heart. <laughs> It's true. Maybe you shouldn't say it just like that. <laughs> Luke chapter 6 verse 45, Jesus said this, The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And Jesus says if there's good things in our heart, then good things will come out. And if there's evil things in our heart, then evil will come out. Our words are one of the truest indicators of what's really in our heart. The words that come out when the filter's not in are one of the truest indicators of what's really lurking in your heart. Our words come from the overflow of our heart. They're one of the truest indicators of the heart's content. Words have the power to destroy, to tear down. And many of you have not only used words that have destroyed and torn down, but you've been there. You've been hurt. You've been injured. You've felt the pain that words can bring. But just as words can destroy, words can give life. And words can bring healing and hope and good. Destructive words, they ruin our lives and they ruin other people's lives. They stain, they burn, they destroy. But God has a different plan. What you can't control, God can and will transform if you allow Him. And when we experience God's incredible grace in our life, when we experience His mercy, when we experience His kindness, when we realize that although I didn't deserve it and you didn't deserve it, Jesus died in my place. He absorbed the Father's wrath on my behalf. And He conquered my sin and He conquered my death and He's given me His life. And I can allow His transforming power. The Bible says that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. It's available to you. You have to take hold of it. You have to access it. But it's there. And that power can change the way that you talk. And when grace fills your heart, it will flow from your lips. When you become consumed with the love of your Savior and the kindness of your Savior and the goodness of your Savior, when that is what's filling your heart, it will flow from your mouth. When our lives are filled with God's grace and we're absorbed in His love and His goodness, when we're filling our hearts with good things, it will change the way we talk. You see, you can't change the way that you talk by yourself. You can put a filter on it, but you can't change it, right? James tells us no one can tame the tongue. Don't think that you're smarter than God. But what you can't control, God can transform. We can't control it. We can't change it. But God can. And God's in us. And so within us is the power to talk differently. James, earlier in his letter, addressed the issue of the mouth. And he said this, he said, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. And so James very much makes the argument that if God isn't transforming the way that we talk, our faith is useless and worthless. 
You see, God has no desire for us just to believe in Him. He wants us to believe Him. And when we believe Him, He transforms our life. God doesn't want your faith to be something that's just intellectual. He wants it to be something that changes and transforms your life. He lives in you. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. I want to give you a few practical practices. Alright? A few practical practices for allowing God's power to change the way that you talk. Number one, guard your heart. Right? Because it's out of the overflow of the heart that what? The mouth speaks. And so we realize, if I am going to allow God to transform the way that I talk, the way that I speak, that I have to allow God to deal with my heart. And I need to deal with what might be lodged in my heart. What is it in my heart that's causing me to say the things that I do? What's lodged in my heart that causes me to lash out and say things that are unkind or cruel or hurtful? What is it that's there? It, it may be that something, maybe some hurt, maybe some pain, maybe a bad experience, maybe it's some sin that's lodged in your heart and God wants to deal with your heart. He wants you to allow His light and His love to probe into your heart and to see what's there and maybe there's some things that need to be confessed and dealt with. Well, bring it to God. He's waiting to, he's waiting to forgive you. But then we need to to protect our heart. We need to protect what we allow into our heart because everything that you take into your heart will come out of your mouth eventually. What goes into our heart and into our life comes out of our mouth. It's why Solomon said this in Proverbs 4, 23. Above all else. This is a letter he was writing to his son. He says, above all else, guard your heart. Protect your heart. For it affects everything that you do. And so be careful about what you allow into your heart. Because it will affect the way that you live. It will affect the way that you talk. Number two, to guide your mouth. Last night, we, we, the subject was brought up that we don't have to say everything that we think. Right? How much better would our lives be if we did not say everything that we thought? Psalm 141, verse 3. It says, Set a guard... Over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. What would happen if you prayed that prayer every morning? If every morning you sort of just began the day saying, God, set a guard over my mouth today. I realize that, that within my mouth is this incredible power. And that there's power to bring life, and there's power to bring hope, and there's power to encourage. But there's also power to destroy, power to hurt, power to cut down, power to kill. And God recognizing that there's this incredible power within me. God set a guard over the door of my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. David said in Psalm 19 verse 14, he says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Ask God to guide your mouth. You don't have the power to talk differently, but God does and he lives in you. So ask him to help you. I promise you this, he will answer that prayer. Every time we pray according to God's will, he will answer that prayer. You know, when I came here as a camper, one of the things that God convicted me about was the way that I talked. Now, I had a good filter. You would have never heard me say anything at school. Or, I mean, let me back up, at home or at church that was, that was really that bad. But at school I would because I thought that would help me fit in. And God greatly convicted me when I was sitting where you sat that what I was doing wasn't honoring to God. And in fact, it was hurting and wounding and tearing down. It was destroying my ability to share my faith. And it was injuring people and hurting people. And it was hurting myself. Ask God to guide your mouth. And number, number three, ask God to use your words to build others up. You see, just as our mouths have the incredible power to destroy... They also have the power to build up and to encourage. Paul says this in Ephesians 4.29. He says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. 
See, every day, you and I, we have to manage the pressure of saying things that we shouldn't say or using our tongues for evil. But at the same time, we have this incredible opportunity every single day to bless people with our words. Every single day, there's people in your pathway that need encouragement, that need kindness, that need love that need to be built up. And you have the power to do that because death and life are in the power of the tongue and you have a tongue. Right? And so every day you have this incredible power to do good. You have the power to build up. The power to give grace to those who hear. Our words should reflect the grace that we've received in Christ. God wants to use your life and your mouth to not be an instrument of unrighteousness but to be an instrument of His grace and His mercy and His love. We all have to deal with the pressure of words. None of us are exempt. All of us face this restless evil. And what we can't control, God can transform. And it's my heart and my prayer and my desire for you that God would transform the way that you talk. Because it's so important. Your words have the power of life and death. Did you know you were that powerful? How many of you knew you were that powerful this morning? All right. How many of you know now? All right. You are powerful because within your mouth is the power of life and death. Never forget that. What God, what you can't control, God can transform. Would you bow your heads this morning? I just want you to be really, really honest with God this morning. Anytime we come to God's Word, I believe that He wants to speak into our life to transform us, to bring us closer to Him. And how many of you, with no one looking around and just being real honest, would say, you know, I, I realize that the way I talk really doesn't honor God usually, and, and I, I'm convicted about that. Would you just have the courage to raise your hand so that I could pray for you? Just know that I was there with you. Thank you so much. I, I want to pray for you, and I want to pray for all of you. Because this is a pressure we all deal with, but I promise you, God will and can transform the way that you talk, if you allow Him. Father, we come before you this morning. Father, we're so thankful that you are gracious and you're kind and you're merciful. Father, I thank you that, that you have given us the ability to use this muscle in our mouth. Although it is by nature evil and by nature it destroys and it tears down. Father, that with your power in us, it can become an instrument of good. And it can bless, and it can encourage, and it can give life. So, Father, I thank you for that. And, Father, I just pray that you would help us to be more and more aware of the power of our words. That once we speak them, to realize that they are gone forever. That we can't take them back. We can't get them back. We can't undo what they've done. But, Father, I thank you that you do forgive, and that you heal, and that you restore. And, Father, I pray that we would truly learn to let you fill our hearts with your love and your grace, that you would guide our words that we use each day. And Father, that you would use us each day to build up, to encourage, and to give life. And Father, for those this morning that, that uh, indicated that they want to change the way that they talk, Father, I pray that you would help them to know that you have forgiven them and that if they will access your power, that you will transform the way that they talk for your glory and for your kingdom. Father, we love you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.